your company was a lot of fun to cover for a long time. Because <laughs> we were, we're happy to. Uh, it's less fun to cover now. It's quieter. <laughs> uh, maybe more successful though. So let's let's catch people up. Uh, Hulu is a joint venture between several of the big media companies, Fox, ABC, NBC. You can look at the disclosure thing about NBC and Fox Media, blah, blah, blah. Um, it was Clown Co., then it was going to disrupt TV. <laughs> then there was a whole question about the future of Hulu. Then the owners tried to sell it twice. Then the founding CEO left. Now you're here. You've been here, what, two years now? Yeah, a little over two years. Two years. Yeah. You guys have not disappeared. You're growing. How many, you, you, and you sell subscriptions, you provide free content. Um, tell us, give us, give us a sense of scale. Where, sure. where are you at right now? So, um, you know, we count well over 30 million viewers across the different platforms. We have a free uh, layer online uh, on PCs where we have some free content. We principally use that as an upsell to one of our two subscription offerings, one with a limited commercials offering and one with no commercials. And you get a lot more content, and you get an ability to have that content on every device. How many folks are paying you for that subscription? We we don't announce those figures, but it's been growing pretty rapidly over the last. The last number you announced was nine. About right? nine, and that was a while ago. Yeah, it was almost a year ago. I'm assuming you have not shrunk since then. We've not shrunk. We're uh, okay. we're pretty happy. So with So I'm going to guess you're above 10 million. Um, and how many of those are, what percent are, the, the, one of the interesting things about the way your business has shifted recently is you recently said, uh, yes, even though all our owners are in the advertising business, we are going to let you watch last night's television without seeing an ad that costs, what, a few dollars more per subscription? Yeah, that's uh, $11.99, $4 more for, for. So for $4 more, you can watch La Empire, whatever yep. aired last night without seeing an ad. The breakdown of your 10 million plus subscribers, how many are getting the ad free version? How many are getting the one with ads? I'd, you know, the vast, vast majority of subscribers are choosing the, the commercial plan uh, versus the no commercial. Because they love commercials? Um, well, I think it's the price point. I think that, you know, we've, we did a lot of research when we set the price and decided to do this. And what you find is that there are really two, set, two types of people. There are ad avoiders and ad acceptors, essentially, when you look at the world. And uh, obviously, there are more classifications than people than that. But you find that people that are ad avoiders are just rabid, rabidly so. They, they wouldn't have come and subscribed to Hulu if we didn't offer a plan like this. Um, and what we also saw is it was really eating away at the foundation of our brand. Um, if you were to look at, you know, tw you know, six months ago, if you were to go on Twitter and search for Hulu and ads, uh, you'd get a lot of responses in there, and there'd be a lot of profanity as well. <laughs> and what we found is that by offering this choice, uh, the customers... That's what that, Twitter's for, is cursing. It's cursing, right? it is. A lot. And what, by offering this choice, what we found is that the customers that stay in the commercial plan are happier because they understand the bargain. Um, and advertisers now are really the heroes of Hulu because customers realize that they're saving $4. Wait, I'm confused. So, the, so since you offer uh -huh. the paid version, the people who are getting the free version are not swearing at, on Twitter anymore? Well, no, there's two paid versions, right? right. There's one with ads right. and Sorry. one without. So, so the so ones that took the, that, stuck, the, that stayed with the $7.99 plan that has advertising, they're happier as a, as a general rule. They're not fucking shit up on Twitter anymore. Not as, not, not as, not as uh, profoundly. Because they know there's an option that's yeah, they know there's an more. Option. So not to beat this in the ground, but do you, so you think it's more ideological than the, than the $4 difference? Or do you think that $4 is a meaningful amount of money? I think $4 is a meaningful amount of money for people. And, and you know, entertainment is, you know, people are fickle with their entertainment dollar. And, and I think that if you are really an ad avoider, you're willing to pay for that. And if you're not, you, you're fine taking the $8 plan. So I'm gonna go, we're going, to, we're going to table the idea of, of ad-free business in a minute, but uh, we'll come back to it. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to you taking this job. You, sure. you took this job after Jason Kyler had this job. Jason was, again, a lot of fun to write about. Um, feuded with a lot of people, made bold statements. For a while, it looked like he was trying to sort of create an exit mm -hmm. for himself. Um, and he had a very hard job, by all counts. He was trying to get multiple different big media organizations to work together. Um, there is a long history of those kind of joint ventures not working very well, or at least being fraught. We had Eric Huggers talking about some of those issues last night. Um, why, why would you take that job? It seems like a very difficult job to, you had a pretty good job at Fox prior to this. Yeah, well, was look, I was, I, I was on the board of Hulu uh, uh, for a few years before. So you'd seen I many of the warts. Company, so I'd seen, I knew what, what I was getting into. and. I think the seminal moment for me was when Fox and Disney kind of came together and said, look, let's really make a run here and really invest more in Hulu. Let's get behind it 
and there was definitely a meeting of the minds about the strategy of the company. Um, and that's held true for the last two plus years, and, and, uh, and so I think a lot of that tension and, and whatever was being reported is not, it's not there now. So, but there was a tension. What was the thing that, was the, that Fox and Disney couldn't agree on about the future of Hulu? Well, look, I, th I you know, it's, lots been written about that. I'm not sure I would, would be advancing. You were, you were on the board. A whole Remind lot, us. <laughs> a whole lot to that. But, you know, be, need, needless to say, there were disagreements about the future in terms of subscriptions and free, how to deal with the, with the, with the content, the, how much to spend, what were we going to try to make the business. And there was so much disagreement that a couple times they said, well, let's just sell the thing. Yeah, look, I think it was complicated. But, yeah, there was, we, we did try to sell it twice. So instead of selling it, they said, no, 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 we're going to mm -hmm. keep it yep. for now. We're going to put some money into it. We're going to hire you to run it. We're also going to start getting into the original content business. This was yeah. right as Netflix was starting to ramp up. Yep. House of Cards, Amazon was putting its toe in the waters. I think they went publicly committed $750 million. Yes, that, the, that, was, the, that was the number publicly it's a, discussed it's back a in 13. Big chunk of money. Yep. But this is at a time when Netflix was spending a couple billion dollars a year buying content, and now they're up to five or six billion dollars a year. Um, so for a long time, it seemed like there was Netflix, which was really serious about building a OTT video subscription service, and Amazon, which might be, and then Hulu, which was owned by these television companies that kind of were interested in that idea, but really their core business was TV, and they weren't going to commit major resources to building a thing that would fundamentally compete with their core product. So has that changed? Well, I don't think we're doing anything that competes with the core product. You know, we're, we're investing heavily in syndication windows, essentially, for content. With film, we're making originals. Uh, what we've really done as a content strategy is try and broaden the content beyond current season shows. Uh, we were getting just so, you know, weren't getting, we were getting as far as we were getting with current season alone, and what we found from customers is that they wanted more films. Because the wanted pitch for Hulu for a long time was you can see what was on TV last, last night, night, today. Yeah. For free, or now you could pay for exactly, it. Exactly, exactly. But, but that wasn't enough for customers. They wanted really, to have... Really, because it seems like it's the best programming on TV you guys have. It's the one thing Netflix can't have. Um, it's still something that millions of people watch on television. Oh, sure. It seems like a really compelling pitch. Sure, well, current season TV is literally like air, right? I mean, it's over the air. Uh, it's online for free in many sites. It's via, you have it available via MVPD. So it's not something that as a, as a SVOD provider you can own and take an, a leadership position and saying, we, we're the only place you can get it, because you, you can get it in a lot of places. But it's great stuff. So it's great stuff. I'm not suggesting it's not. Um, but in terms of what we're trying to do with the, with the business to go to get to the next level and really be a competitor, we had to broaden the content base. We had to add films. We had to add complete libraries of shows, not just the current season or the last five episodes. We had to create original content that would mean something to customers, that we could help define our brand, and we've started doing that over the last six or seven months. Um, and so that's what we've been spending a lot of our resources against, is how do we figure out what is the right content to buy or make, uh, what are the viewer segments we're targeting, and then really satisfy those customers. So again, back to that, that, that budget you were going to put in for original content. Again, it sounds like a lot of money, but you hear a lot of commentary. From, from sellers, uh, from Netflix and Amazon themselves, saying we're willing to pay a lot of money for stuff. Yep. Uh, I'm going to get the number wrong, but Amazon's spending a ton of money to buy uh, Top Gear, sure. show it in the US, like an astonishing amount of money. Um, there's the term shock and awe has been used to describe the amount of money Netflix is paying for some of their content. Uh, do you guys need to ramp up to catch up to that? If, if, I'm, if I've got a hot television show, if I'm Aziz Ansari mm -hmm. and I'm walking around, um, aren't I always going to sell that show to Netflix or Amazon before I come to you? No. No, you're not. I mean, we've, we've been very aggressive, and we've stepped up quite a bit over the last couple of years, and we've been in every conversation for virtually every piece of content out there over the last two years. And um, we've got the resources to compete, and I think if you just look at what we've done over the last couple of years from the acquisition side in terms of the output deals we've done, uh, to you know, buying Seinfeld, to or an array of other content deals, and now Originals. We just premiered a show uh, that J.J. Abrams executive produced for us on Monday. Uh, so 11, 11 22, 22, 63. Uh, got a movie star as the lead, you know, and James Franco. And uh, we've, we're going to be launching. To be fair, James Franco shows up in lots of stuff. He does do a lot. Of, he's a very busy guy. Teaches yeah. courses yeah. and, you know, all that sort of thing. But, you know, he, he's, he's great. If you haven't seen it, I think everyone has a free year of Hulu uh, in their bag if you haven't Take picked it up. So uh, watch eleven twenty two. Uh, it's very good, and so, but, but that's just the, the kinds of talent we're attracting. Um, I'm not saying we get every show we go after. It's very competitive, 
Um, but we're, we're doing pretty well, and we're happy with, with the progress we've made. Netflix made a big splash with House of Cards. Amazon fumbled around for a little bit, got transparent, which mm -hmm. is not as big a show, but critically, it's a really sure. big deal. Um, you guys don't have one of those breakout successes. I'm sure you're going to argue with me and say you do, but perception-wise, you don't. Um, how important is it for you to have one of those things, or does it really not matter as long as your I think numbers? It matters. Are we're, that's what we're shooting for. You know, I think we just started launching new original shows with a new team in the fall, um, and one of the first three we launched was Casual. It got our first Golden Globe nomination. Uh, 1122 broke this week. We're, we're thrilled with what we see from this new show called The Path, Aaron Paul's return to TV from Breaking Bad. Uh, that's going to come out in March. So we're, we're going to take some swings and some shots. And you know, this is a, a tricky business, right? It's a creative endeavor. And um, you know, what we're trying to do is give creators the resources they need, try to pick stories and creators that we think can make a great show for us that will resonate. And, and go for it. And we're going to launch a lot of shows this year and try to make that happen. Seems like you guys should have a leg up on the tech companies because you're owned by the content companies and this should be in your DNA. Making shows, yep. picking shows should be in your DNA. There was a lot of skepticism about whether this would work for Netflix and Amazon because they're nerds and what do they know about content? They've made it look relatively easy. They just go out and throw a bunch of money and then a bunch of shows are hits. Um, does it frustrate you that you sort of haven't caught up to them, at least perception-wise? No, we're not frustrated at all. I mean, we really just started, and we're really satisfied with where we are today. You know, we just literally launched our first originals in this new regime four months ago. So um, we're happy with those. We're happy with what's coming. Uh, you know, I think being an SVOD provider, having a, this one-to-one -one consumer relationship and the data that that provides you really does help you make decisions. Um, it's not just as simple as reading a script, getting a showrunner, attaching talent. That, of course, happens. <laughs> Um, but what kinds of shows you want to make surely can be in, informed by the data of what your customers are consuming. You know, what genres, what types of shows uh, should you be trying to commission? And that certainly has helped, I think, us. It's going to help, and I know it's helped the, the other guys as well. So you said a few minutes ago, we can't compete with the core product that our owners sell. That seems like you're fundamentally competing. That You've got your hands tied behind your back. You can't make a product that's as awesome as it should be because fundamentally Fox doesn't want to compete with Hulu. Fox doesn't want to compete I don't think, I, don't, I, think I said that. I, what I said was uh, <laughs> we're not competing with them. Uh -huh. uh, we, we have a great set of content. We buy a lot of content from our owners and others. Um, we're competing for customers' time and money and, and advertising dollars in a general market. Uh, so I guess to that extent, you could argue we are in competition with everybody who procures content, distributes it, and sells ads against it and takes subscription fees. Um, but we, are, we look at ourselves as a great complement to Everything, right? I mean, I don't think people are going to say, I'm just going to buy Hulu, or I'm just going to buy Netflix, or I'm going to just buy Amazon. A huge percentage of our customers buy pay TV as well, and we're a, an add-on or a complement to the pay TV bundle. So, um, you know, we're, we're trying to compete with everyone. If you want to make an argument that we're competing with our owners, you can, but that's not our direct do, focus. Do Bob Iger or James Murdoch or any of the Murdochs, would they prefer me to watch Empire or the Goldbergs on their networks or Hulu? Do they care? I would say they would answer the question, we'd like you to watch that. We'd like, we'd like you to watch Empire irrespective of where you watch it. I think we're all in the business of driving consumption. Um, they, they sell a lot of advertising against those shows on Hulu. Um, they get credit for that view just like they do on a Fox.com or on a DVR or on a VOD. So it's all equal footing now as long as, as long as Yeah, look, I think we're, we're all trying to build brands. And so, you know, we're, we're trying to build the Hulu brand. We're also very conscious of trying to build our, our partner's brands, whether it's our owner's brands. We license from, uh, from third parties as well. You know, we have a big deal with Viacom, so we're constantly promoting back to, to Comedy Central and to MTV. Um, so that's part of our strategy is to try to help our partners build their brands, because if they're successful, their shows on Hulu will be more successful as well. So one of the advantages of being owned by those guys, it seems like, from the outside right now, is there's a lot of throat clearing and, and more. They're being more pronounced, uh, both uh, Tom Warner we can talk about in a second, but Murdoch's in particular saying, look, we're going to start pulling stuff back. We're going to be less, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're not going to license as much stuff as we have to Netflix in particular, but to some of the other uh, subscription video competitors. Um, at the same time, a lot of those shows seem to be showing up on a Hulu. Are you talking to them specifically about that, or are they just magically sort of letting Empire show up on, on Hulu? <laughs> well, it's, I wish it was magic, but no, it's, it's a marketplace. You pay money for it. We're pay, yeah, we're, it's a marketplace, you know, in that example. That was 
shopped to every SVOD player. It Netflix had a process. chance to, to, to bid Everybody on bid on it, and we were fortunate enough to have the winning bid and, and, and put in the highest number. Um, and I think we, have, we bring other benefits, and part of our, our pitch to suppliers is it's not just, you know, here's a check and give us the, the assets. It's we're going to promote back to the network. We're going we're gonna to make sure there's attribution between your network and the show so that if, if you are a fan of Empire, you're going to know it's a Fox show if, if you're watching it on Hulu. So that's very important to them, and, and we lean into that as a strategy. Um, but we're competing in the marketplace for content with everybody, and uh, you know there are plenty of shows that our owners have sold to our competitors as well, and that's just because it's a market. And so they're not giving you a leg show. up. They're not putting a thumb on the scale. They're treating you just like anybody else. No, and you know they can't. They really can't. I mean, they own a third of us. It's not. You know, we're not wholly owned. There's no real reason for them to do that. And for the, for them, they're trying to maximize their value. So there's one theory that says, look, the, the, the notion that you're going to be able to go and pay a subscription fee and watch last night's Empire on Fox, that can't sustain permanently. It's going to eventually have to become, the, the term is an authenticated play, right? So you, Hulu is going to become what you get to watch Fox shows on. Eventually it's going to become an extension of ABC and Fox, whoever owns it. Um, is that where you're headed or is this always going to remain a separate product? We're building a. We're trying to build a, a real big consumer brand. Uh, we've got our subscription offerings, and so we're, we're plowing ahead, heads down, trying to build that. Um, we've had TV everywhere authenticated content on Hulu for several years. Right, um, sort of downplayed. Yeah, we downplayed a little bit because it's. We feel like it's got to be one of those things that's ubiquitous. You sort of have to have every MVPD allowing their customers to come in and watch. Right. It's not, like it's not so great if it's just AT&T or just Dish doing this. Yeah, it could actually be a negative to customers, right? If you, if you have last night's episode of um, American Horror Story and somebody comes in and they just happen to be a Comcast customer or a DirecTV customer, those are two companies that haven't allowed their customers to authenticate on Hulu, it's a bad experience. They, you know, they feel like we're not providing them something. Um, and so we do try to, I wouldn't say downplay it, we're just not promoting it very heavily. But we, I do think that that's an opportunity for us over the longer run if we can run the table and have broad adoption in the marketplace. And does that then move from a subscription business to just something that becomes part of the, those existing businesses? I think it's part of it. I think, uh, you know, for example, in that we, we don't require somebody to have a Hulu subscription to be able to access that content today if their pay TV operator right. is allowing it. That's part of our sort of free business that serves as an upsell mechanism. Uh, CBS, I'm sorry, not CBS, Fox, ABC, NBC, CBS is proudly not uh, an equity owner. Um, there's a discussion about Time Warner joining you guys. Where, where are things going there? So I've seen those news reports as well. I'm not, uh, again, going to advance that story here today, but you know, we're, we like Time Warner. We have a great operating relationship with them. We buy content from Turner Networks. We have a big output deal with them. In fact, Warner Brothers is the studio behind 1122. 63, which we talked about earlier. Time Warner is a company that said, look, we have to start pulling back some of this content. We can't make all our TV shows available on places like Netflix. When I talk to folks at Time Warner, they say we can't join Hulu unless Hulu is going to sort of fundamentally change what it is they do. The, the notion that you can watch last night's TV on Hulu is going to have to change. Um, do you anticipate making that change in the near future? You know, like I said before, we're trying to build a great brand and really balance and round out our content mix uh, for whatever eventuality. I mean, we have content from Fox, ABC, and NBC that are owners. We also license CW for Next Day Air. We license Univision. A lot of content from uh, the Viacom channels come the next day. We've got the Daily Show for, for five years. So um, we'll see what the future holds. We're not sitting here planning anything at the moment. You guys do, uh, uh, I can watch clips on Hulu, but it's really long form stuff, right? There's an explosion right now of platforms like Snapchat, mm -hmm. Spotify, Verizon, pushing short form mobile stuff for different reasons. Yeah. Is there a place for you to play there? Absolutely, we have a tremendous consumption of clips on our service and we syndicate a lot of those clips across the web today. Um, in fact, I don't know, who's, who's watched uh, our Triumph uh, election special out there. Anybody seen any clips or watch that? Nothing? Just rich. A lot of, yeah, there's a lot of people. I'm trying to do a podcast with Robert Smigels. Um, Maybe you can help that out. He's great. Um, so that, that's an example of something we actually made as a long form asset. You can watch the whole special on Hulu, but we also clip it up and have distributed it online. Um, for promotional purposes and to get some buzz, and it's uh, it's pretty fun. If you haven't seen it, you guys should. And that's the it. that's the upside for you guys. There is not so much whatever ad revenue you're going to generate, but to yeah. drive subscriptions. Yeah, we're driving subscriptions, selling ads, just trying to just create brand awareness and, and brand love, as we call it. Again, 
this is a really hard job, or it seems like it's a very hard job, getting a bunch of, of content owners with different agendas together. Have, have you been on the board? Do you watch your predecessor? Uh, how are you approaching things differently, or what, what, what did you take from that experience? Well, I think we're, we're trying to run the business as an independent entity, essentially. You know, we have board members and companies that sit on our board and, and advise us and approve, you know, budgets and the things that you would assume a board would do. But we, we have to approach it as if we're entering a marketplace. And so if you do that um, and you, you, you try to operate that way, you're, it's going to reduce conflict. And, and that's how we approach it. You know, we have, I have great relationships with everybody on, the, on our board and, uh, you know, at each company. And, um, it's a, it's a it's teamwork. You're not calling them up and yelling at them? <laughs> no, that's, that's not usually not a good policy to call up Some and yell at your boss. Um, we talked about ad free at the beginning, I want to come back to it. Um, many folks, uh, including folks who run Netflix, say, if you, if you guys are worried about cord cutting, you shouldn't be pointing the finger at us, you should look at, at Hulu that's making their stuff available without ads. They're cutting into their core product. How did, how did you and the network owners decide that selling products without ads is a good business decision short term and then strategically it seems like you're really sort of undercutting the main part of their business. You know our ad business since we launched the commercial free plan is up 30 percent. Um, so we've really not seen it impact our ad business or the ad businesses of our, of our owners or any kind of content partner that's supplying us content. You don't think content. signaling to subscribers or just people saying look you can watch all this TV don't have to pay for an ad there's a cost for it, right? I mean, if you look at the array of options today for people to avoid ads from a DVR to, to EST to a whole host of things, they can wait. You know, you can wait and watch those shows uh, on an SVOD platform like ours or Netflix and, and avoid ads if you, if you choose to. What we, would just, what we calculated was putting a price tag on ad skipping uh, that, that is done in a way that can monetize the actual ad skipping as opposed to a DVR, which all that money goes straight to the distributor. Uh, we thought that was important to try to move the move the so conversation. You're accepting forward. the reality that people don't want to watch ads. That some people don't want to watch ads, and you said, "All right, there's a dollar value at which that makes sense for us. Yeah. Allows us to continue to have an ad business in other places." Exactly. How long did it take to to get the board to sign off on that? Oh gosh, we worked on that. It was you know decided and launched inside of a year. That's quick for big media. We're we're nimble. We're moving yeah. fast. We uh, we got a lot of a lot of competitors we're competing against that are moving fast too. We had Eric up here yesterday, and he was spending a lot of time talking about improving product. Um, and I said, I don't really know why that matters. If I'm going to watch a video, I'm going to watch a video. Is a product important for a product like your like your company? Oh, it's huge. You know, I think half our company are engineers and product development executives. And again, isn't the value the show? Well, I think it's both. You know, you can, you know, I think I've always taken the position you, you can't, you can have great tech and a great product, and if you don't have good content, no one cares. I think if you have great content, but you don't have a good product, you're just going to piss off your customers. So I want to, I've subscribed to Hulu. We, my wife subscribed to Hulu because she wanted to watch Empire. Mm -hmm. she didn't realize we could also watch it on, on cable, on VOD, but now we're watching it. Thank her for me. Um, so we're still paying for it. Why, why is the, the improved product helping us? continue to pay for that? Or what's the, what's the upside for me as a consumer? I think it's, I mean, we're making our product much more, you've heard a lot of people come up and talk about personalization. That's clearly something that we've, we've invested in. We're making it much more personalized. So you know, if you think about it, we have, I think, 5,000 different series of TV on Hulu. Um, you're not going to be interested in all 5,000, right? Yeah. There's probably a dozen right Pretty now. Pretty much just that, watching The Profit and Shark Tank. There you go. So we should know that, and we should be recommending shows. And you to say, you. here's The Profit and Shark Tank. You, and they, you keep we showing that, that to me. But you don't show me anything else. Well, hopefully we are showing you other things that are like that we'll or that, cu it. that customers, other customers that watch those shows, you know, the different sort of demographics and, and viewer profiles that might, might merge with that. But making the product more, more accessible, more personal, uh, easier to use, remembering where you left off on. I mean, there's some, some real table stakes things that we're doing um, and improving upon that, that a lot of other people don't do in this space. Um, and just making that product just better and better every day is a mission for, we've got five or 600 people. How do you hire those folks? Are they, um, mm -hmm. You could go work at Hulu back in the old days because right. that was being run kind of like a venture back company. Mm -hmm. There was gonna be an upside, there was gonna be a liquidity event. That's not happening anymore. 
how do, you, how do you bring on awesome talent that could be working at Snapchat or Google or Facebook? Well, look, you know, you, when you look at talent management and you're trying to bring in, you know, folks in that, in that world, you're, you're clearly not going to entice somebody who is looking for, you know, what we'd like to call lottery ticket, right? Some, an engineer or, or a person that's really looking to get a piece of equity at a startup and, and ring the bell. That's not what people can have at Hulu, but what they can have is in a really exciting work environment where their work finds its way onto the screen every day. Um, we pay really well, uh, and it's a great culture and environment. And so I think we're attracting the, the folks that, that would like that in their life. Um, and we've been pretty successful. I'd say you know, we've added, I think we've grown the company workforce by almost 50% in the last year. Um, we'll do it again this year. And so we're attracting talent. We've got offices in Santa Monica where we have a lot of software development, Beijing and in Seattle. And, and all of those uh, facilities are growing pretty, pretty And soon. maybe this is a year or two where the idea of an IPO isn't quite as exciting for some folks as well. <laughs> exactly. That, that helps. Right. Uh, questions from Mike. Maybe someone can get him to talk about the Time Warner deal. <clears throat> Hey, Mike, I'm David Nassar. I uh, run communications at the Brookings Institution in Washington. What are you guys thinking about documentaries and about short form, uh, you know, short form fact based uh, video content? We, uh, we love documentaries. In fact, we just did a recent deal with IFC Films that'll get us a, a, a lot of documentaries to add to our slate. Um, we're going to likely do some original documentaries as well this year. Um, the way we're looking at the originals in the doc world is. We're pop culture, we're entertainment, we're TV, so, so when we make something, it probably ought to be in that vein. Um, but then we license a whole array of docs um, from a lot of providers, and we're building a library there. Uh, what's a good business for us? We like it, our customers like it. We listen to them, you know, when people cancel. We have a pretty efficient way of understanding from them why are they canceling, and, we, and if it's a content-related issue, we aggregate that data and then use it to, to make the product better. And so just really quick, then, is there also a place for like short three-minute explainer-type videos on, on things that are happening in the world and stuff like that that people might want to watch? while they're consuming other content on Hulu, just, oh, that uh, interesting. Vox.com. <laughs> yep, they go to Vox. Yep. Go to, go to, go. Uh, sure, I, it's not something we're mainly focused on. We look at ourselves principally as an entertainment business. Um, we do have some news. We have uh, the library, or the, um, you know, more of the, the magazine shows that come from Fox or NBC, ABC on the service now, whether it's 2020 or, or Fox News Sunday or that sort of thing. Um, and that gets some consumption, but we're principally in it. We look at ourselves as an entertainment business. Yeah, Mark Mahaney at RBC. A couple questions. Would you say anything about the profitability of the business now, or is it something that you'll get at some point in the future? Secondly, do you think you have pricing power with your subscribers? Do you foresee over the next three to five years to be able, the ability to triaging services or offering different types of content to take pricing up? And then finally, when you talked about the, the, the acquiring content and how competitive that is, would, was it 90% of the time that the biggest check wins? Uh, you mentioned a couple of cases where that may not be the case, but how often is it that the biggest check doesn't win? Sure. So um, profitability, we're not, we don't announce or talk about our, our, um, those numbers uh, in public. We're in clearly in investment mode if you, if you just look at our owner's filings. Um, but we have a path, and we're, we're excited about where, where we're going on the top line and with subscriptions. Certain, our ad business has really been a sleeper for us. It's really growing pretty quickly. Um, second one was pricing power. With your pricing power. You charge more. Uh, we're really aggressively trying to grow the sub base, so we're not really thinking very hard at the moment about raising price because we think that's kind of counter. That's probably not going to have a. Uh, um, and it'll have a negative impact on on sub growth. But I think over time we will. Um, you know, we've been watching Netflix and, and watching their pricing increases. Obviously, Amazon's got a little bit of a different model with the shipping business, and they've recently gone through a price increase that didn't seem to have uh, much of a, a blip for them. So we'll see in the future, but it's not something uh, we're looking at right now. Um, generally, the biggest check is going to win. I think that you know, what we're trying to do is give people an, an additional incentive to go with us over the other guy if, in fact, we're in the same ballpark. Um, but it's, it's hard to see how a content owner will take less money from anybody for, uh, you know, certainly materially less money. Your, your, uh, your colleagues over at uh, Fox Studios got a movie deal uh, in which they paid less than Netflix mm -hmm. was offering. We can have a discussion yeah. later. Sure. Rich, real quick. Rich Greenfield, BTIG. Just real quick, um, you sat on the other side at Fox. You know, when you look at all the media companies, they keep taking those quote-unquote checks that you just mentioned uh, in answer to Mark's question. 
why is the right decision for all media companies, whether they're your owners or even the people who just third party sell you content, why is it not the right decision for all of these programmers to not be building their own direct to consumer businesses, services, capabilities versus licensing to Hulu, Netflix, Amazon, and others if the world is moving to streaming over the long term? Sure. Uh, that's a great question. Um, I know you've asked it before. <laughs> uh, Look, I think there's definitely a power in aggregation. I think that as you look at any individual brand, I mean, there's certain brands that probably could go broader. Obviously, you've got the, the premium guys who have an a la carte business, and now they're over the top as a bundle of content. Uh, it's certainly aggregated, you know, we, we saw it with Hulu when we launched, right? We launched with NBC and Fox content. All the content on Hulu at launch as a free service was available on both of those sites. And yet, pretty quickly out of the gate, Hulu was three, four times the amount of streaming happening at Hulu versus just those. And then when you started to aggregate more and more, you, you have a higher take rate. So I think that there's a, definitely a power in aggregation and ability to monetize content when you've got a lot more than just one brand's worth. So that could be part of the calculus. Speed round. Lucas. Uh, Lucas Shaw with Bloomberg. Uh, when you expand overseas, Will you do so on your own like Netflix has done, or are you more likely to partner with a, a pay provider and just two quick ones that probably won't elicit answers? Uh, where will you go first, and will we see you overseas by, by the end of this year? Um, we're looking at a variety of things internationally. We're currently really heads down and trying to build the U.S. business. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities out there, but uh, we're, we're, not, we're not focused on them at the moment. Yeah, correct, because variety. A quick question. You sell Showtime as an add-on bundle over the top right now. How many more of those do you want to add? And on the flip side, doesn't this kind of uh, force your hand a little bit with some of the networks? Wouldn't CW come to you and say, instead of being part of the base bundle, we really, really want to get another five bucks from you guys? Sure, it's a great question. Uh, we look at Showtime and the premium networks, the existing a la carte packages differently than we would you know, a, a, a basic cable or a basic uh, a broadcast channel. Because they're already a premium because network? Because they're already a premium network, and, and we, you know, we're not the exclusive place where you can buy Showtime. Uh, we will likely add others. Um, nothing to announce, obviously, today, but well, I think there's an opportunity. make a bigger bundle? Uh, it's not a bundle. It's, it's, a, it's a store, almost, right? I mean, you, you can add these things to your Hulu package, um, and we'll see what happens in the future on that. Last one. Uh, Ryan with AP. Uh, hi, Mike. Uh, there's a notion that there's too much scripted TV out there, including from the head of Fox Networks. Um, uh, you know, at what point, and I know you, know you guys are in buying mode, but at what point, you know, is there too much? I mean, do you, do you see consumers not watching the show enough or, or not moving the needle enough or, you know, it's too hard to find good, good shows out there? I mean, what's, when, when do you hit the peak? I think you hit it. My, I mean, I, my personal point of view, um, is that there's too many crappy shows out there, right? And not enough good shows. And um, I think we're all sort of trying to make great shows. Uh, and one of the things that's happened over the course of the last several years is that you don't have to settle for a bad show, right? I mean, as a consumer, you just don't. You, you, you don't have to sort of sit back and wait and see what's on and pick, from the, pick the best of the worst options, right? You can find almost any show at any time in any place and, and watch that and consume that. And so that's certainly raised the bar quite a bit, I think, on the, on the quality of content that you have to make. Um, but, you know, so that's how we look at it. And, and so everything we're making, we're hoping and working hard to make it you great. You should be talking it down and say there's a lot of crap and we're not going to pay for it. Well, that's true, too. I'll try to help you with negotiating. With <laughs> Thank you very much. So that's how we look at it. I don't know that there's, I think there's probably a lot out there, but I don't know that you can say there's too much good stuff. Okay, so that was a conversation. You were worried that was, this was going to be volatile. You were very, you were very so, nice. You were very gentle. Nice. It was a good gentle. conversation, right? It was good. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate, appreciate it. it.